Welcome to the Future Security Initiative Spring Speaker Series. My name is Daniel Rothenberg. As many of you know, I'm co-director of the Future Security Initiative. We're a partnership between Arizona State University and New America, which is a DC-based think tank. Um, and one of the things that we do is, is run speaker series and conferences and events, as well as research programming and uh, an MA in global security. I know some of you are part of that program who are here with us today. Um, we're thrilled um, to have Nathan Thrall join us. Um, he is the author of the recently released book, A Day in the Life of Abed Salama, Anatomy of a Jerusalem Tragedy. And that will be the subject of what we're talking about today. It was named the best book of the year by the New Yorker, Time, The Economist, The New Republic, and The Financial Times, and selected as a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice. His previous book is The Only Language They Understand, Forcing Compromise in Israel and Palestine. His essays, reviews, and reported features have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Guardian, and the London Review of Books, as well as the New York Review of Books. In fact, this book is a sort of expansion of a really quite famous article uh, that Nathan wrote in the New York Review of Books. Um, they've been translated into more than a dozen languages. He spent a decade at the International Crisis Group, where he was the director of the Arab-Israeli Project. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us, Nathan. We're, we're thrilled that you're here with us. You're joining us from uh, Jerusalem. Um, and I just wanted to begin this discussion with a sort of pretty general question, which is, could you give us a sense of what the book's about? That is an overview. Uh, the title is A Day in the Life of Abed Salama. So basically, what is it that the that is the central narrative of the book? Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, so the book is really... Um, it's a work of micro history, and the ambition of the book is to tell the story of Israel Palestine through a single event. And uh, that single event is a, a tragic bus accident involving a group of Palestinian kindergartners from the Jerusalem area. And, uh, and I tell the story of the place in which they live, the, the way, uh, in which they uh, are uh, closed off from the rest of the city, and how uh, on this day uh, they were struck uh, by a giant semi-trailer uh, in the West Bank that was on its way to a settlement quarry. And um, the bus flipped over and caught fire, and six children and one teacher died. And the people who were there at the scene of the accident um, just bystanders on this road, which is a road used almost entirely by Palestinians, they were left to uh, rescue these children from this burning bus. It was more than a half hour before the first Israeli fire truck arrived. And uh, Abed Salama is the father of one of the um, uh, kindergartners on this bus. And I tell the story of Abed's uh, day and his quest to find his son and find out what happened to his son. Um, but it's also, you know, it's called a day in the life of Abed Salama, but it's really about Abed's entire life. And um, through his life and through the lives of other uh, people who, who intersect uh, through this event, I try and tell the bigger uh, story of, of Israel-Palestine, of the First Intifada through Abed, of the uh, Nakba through another uh, character and a uh, doctor who works for the UN Refugee Agency, UNRWA, um, and uh, the settlement project through uh, some of the other characters. So um, yeah, the hope is that through this narrative of really a tight you know, week around this crash, um, you come away with a, a deep understanding of um, of Israel Palestine and and of the occupation, especially. Um, in the epilogue of the book, you recount uh, the way in which a number of Israeli youths responded to the crash, which you know got various news coverage. And that becomes kind of like a framing for for some of the issues that come out in the book, but I'm wondering, you know, if you could talk about what they said, their responses, and also the degree to which that, you know, influenced your decision to investigate what happened and then write a book about it. Um, so on the day of the crash, um, there were 
um, a number of articles in the Palestinian press and in the Israeli press. And, um, and in the Israeli press, there were comment sections, what Israelis call uh, talkbacks, uh, in, uh, that were filled with um, uh, posts of, of jubilation, of, of, of glee at the news that several um, five-year-olds had, had died on this bus. Um, and, um, there were Facebook posts as well. And, and, uh, there was a, an Israeli center left journalist by the name of Arik Weiss, a TV journalist who decided, um, that he wanted to make a TV special about not so much the crash itself, but the, but uh, about Israeli society and about, um, the fact that all of these people were posting, um, their joy at the death of, of these um, kindergartners, and, and they were doing it without pseudonyms, um, that they felt comfortable under their real names um, uh, to celebrate the deaths of these children. And so that was really the, the focus of this TV special that this journalist uh, did. It was titled An Arab Kid Died, Ha 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 Ha, which is a direct quote from one of these posts. And he's really trying to hold up a mirror to his own society and ask, uh, how did we get to this place? Um, how did we arrive um, um, at a situation in which this kind of dehumanization is absolutely um, uh, accepted and um, and people aren't even ashamed to, to display it? Um, for me, that was... Um, a, is a, a late discovery in in this project. It wasn't a motive at all in choosing to write about uh, this accident. Of course, dehumanization is everywhere, um, and it, it's it's so much a part of being in this place, and it's what allows uh, us to see the the scenes that we see today on the news. Um, so I found it, um, of course, important to include. But it was uh, it was a late discovery. It wasn't the motive for for choosing this accident uh, to write about. What was it then that drew you to investigate the accident and then to you know, see it through to a, a major article and then later a book? So th there there are kind of a couple of different answers to that question. One of them um, is that I was just uh, deeply moved by this accident. These are I live in Jerusalem. The parents. Um, um, uh, of the kids on this bus live in the same city as me, but on the other side of a wall in, in a uh, radically different existence uh, than mine. And I wanted to um, I wanted to tell that story because I, I was I was moved by it. Um, but I also felt that it was really uh, emblematic of the utter neglect in which hundreds of thousands of Palestinians live on the other side of the wall. Um, many of them are paying taxes to the Jerusalem municipality and receiving virtually no services. The Palestinian Authority, the, the um, Palestinian government, which has limited autonomy in pockets of the West Bank, isn't allowed into the area where these parents live. They aren't allowed into the area where the crash occurred. Um, and so I felt that it was uh, emblematic and because of the location, it also allowed me to tell so much of the story of the occupation. It allowed me to tell about uh, the annexation of East Jerusalem and uh, more than two dozen surrounding villages, which took place in 1967. And some of the um, uh, people in the book live in areas that were formerly annexed by Israel. Others uh, do not. And this had profound consequences uh, for them on the day of the accident. If you live in an area that was annexed by Israel, you have one color ID, a blue ID. And if you live in another area that it wasn't annexed, you have a green ID. All these people with blue and green IDs are living in one walled enclave, the, the parents of the kids on this bus. And um, you can't tell the difference between the annexed area and the unannexed area. It's just one area of utter neglect. Um, but the, the location allowed me to tell the story of annexation. It allowed me to tell the story of settlements, of outposts, of land, of this town uh, where the school is located, the town of Anatta, um, to, to tell the story of how that, that 
place was transformed and how military bases were erected on it and how a segregated road was uh, um, uh, created and in, in, in this running right through it. And, um, and so that there was a kind of a geographic uh, uh, interest that I had that, that this particular location allowed me to tell so much of the story of, of the, of the occupation. Um, and there was another kind of um, layer to it, which is perhaps too in, in the weeds for this conversation, but a, a, a you know, uh, a short version of it is that when I set out to write the article, I didn't know that it was going to be a book at that point. And before I even knew that it was going, I was going to choose this particular incident, I was looking for a specific kind of story. And the reason uh, I was looking for a specific kind of story is that there was a, a debate raging in uh, Israel at the time about annexing more of the West Bank, more than the, than had been annexed in 1967. Uh, President Trump had released his plan uh, for um, Israel-Palestine, and um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu had vowed that he would annex some significant portion of the West Bank. And all, um, among Jewish Israelis, there was a huge debate raging about whether or not this was a good idea. And many on the center left who opposed uh, the annexation said that this is going to be an absolute disaster for Israel. This is going to not just lead to uh, diplomatic isolation, but is going to lead to one state. And this, the, the next thing after this is we're going to be forced to give Palestinians equal rights and citizenship. Then we will lose a Jewish demographic majority. And the whole purpose of Zionism has been obliter obliterated with our own hands. We're no longer a majority in our own country. We can't control our fate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and I felt that the, that debate was really um, uh, premised on, on a mischaracterization of, of what the reality was in the West Bank, which is that um, the, the settlements had already been annexed uh, de facto. They were connected seamlessly to Israel. They had, you know, fire stations and police stations, and um, they have ports, and they have uh, Israeli schools, and they have HMOs and supermarkets. And you go into them, and you feel that you're in Israel. And and I wanted to illustrate how silly this debate was about you know how disastrous it would be to take this formal step of declaring what had already been done. Um, and so I was looking for places that would illustrate the silliness of the debate, places like the town where these um, parents lived and children, which, which were formally annexed, but on the other side of the wall and treated uh, just like the rest of the West Bank and treated like an unannexed area. And conversely, I was looking also at areas that had not been formally annexed, but were in practice annexed. And so it was that kind of very instrumental search for a, a location that would illustrate a kind of point I wanted to make that led me to the accident, uh, to led me to look just for stories in this place and dig through archives and try and find uh, stories in these kinds of places. And then I came upon the accident, which I had remembered. I lived here when it took place. Um, and as I started to dig into the accident, something happened, which was that I stopped caring so much about the point that I wanted to make and really started caring about that, the story. And the story uh, took over for me. Can you go into a little greater detail about how this particular um, crash uh, how the experience of Abed Salomon searching for his son, how this illustrates exactly, you know, these tensions you're talking about, about annexed territory and blue IDs versus green IDs. What is it that played out in that particular person's life? Yeah. So um, the community of Anatta, which is where the school, this kindergarten is located, uh, is uh, walled off on three sides. Uh, it has a 26-foot-tall concrete wall uh, on three sides. This is known as the separation barrier, sometimes called the apartheid wall. 
And then on a fourth side, there's another kind of wall uh, completing the, the ens encirclement of this community, which is goes through a segregated road, R Route 4370, which has Israeli traffic on one side, Palestinian traffic on the other, and has a giant wall running uh, through the middle of it. About 130,000 people live in this small uh, walled ghetto today. They have, um, within this, this, uh, this enclave, half of it was formally annexed by Israel, half of it was not. You have families that have, some of them have green IDs that, that don't allow them to enter Jerusalem. Some of them have blue IDs that do allow them to enter Jerusalem. There are just two exits from the this uh, enclave, one of them through a checkpoint into Jerusalem, the other uh, going toward the West Bank. And, uh, and, and within the same families, you have people who have green IDs, you have, who have blue IDs, and this affects you know, all kinds of aspects of their lives. I mean, it, it, it re reaches so deeply into their lives that at one point, Abid Salama, the, the title uh, character, he is at risk of losing. He himself has a green ID, had a job in, in Jerusalem, was at risk of losing it along with other employees who had green IDs and went in search of a marriage partner who herself had a blue ID that would allow him to get a blue ID and keep his job. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the degree to which this system, and it's not just the permit system, it's the entire uh, system of, of control that these people live in, the degree to which it, it, it affects their, their daily lives was really the subject of this book and, and what I wanted to highlight. I, I didn't want... Um, I didn't want to write a book about um, something like a war in Gaza, as important as that is. I wanted to write about the situation that exists when there isn't a war in Gaza, when people aren't paying attention, because that's the situation that I, that the whole world has grown accustomed to uh, and, and has resigned itself to accepting uh, in practice. So... Um, if, if, if you don't mind, I, I could read a small uh, portion of the book that actually illustrates uh, exactly what, what uh, you're asking about with the, um, the permits. That would be great. Thank you. So this, uh, this portion of the book uh, takes place uh, near the end of the rescue. Um, and the main thing to know is that the... Um, uh, the main character is named Huda. She's a doctor and a mother. She works for the UN refugee agency, UNRWA. And uh, she's helping to rescue children from this burning bus. And the other person who's mentioned is a man named Salem. And uh, Salem lived in the area. And he heroically, together with one of the teachers, went repeatedly into this burning bus and, and uh, rescued dozens of children, went in and out of this uh, burning bus. <clears throat> Nearly 20 minutes had passed since Huda and her staff had come upon the burning bus. Flames and smoke were still pouring from the smashed windows. Huda's driver, Abu Faraj, was directing traffic, keeping an open path for the evacuees and telling drivers of oncoming cars to turn back. The crowd had grown so large that Huda could no longer see the driver and the teacher she and Salem had pulled from the front of the bus. She was focused on the children, gently carrying them with one of the UN nurses to the cars that had stopped at the accident site. Many of the drivers had volunteered to transport the burn victims and stood ready to race to the nearest accessible hospital, which, for most of them, was in Ramallah. The hospitals in Jerusalem were far better, but only those with blue IDs could reach them. A few of the drivers did have blue IDs, and some took off in the direction of Hadassah Hospital at Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. The majority, those with green IDs, went in the opposite direction, along the flooded road to Ramallah. Nearly all the children had been brought off the bus when Salem, who had by now gone in and out of the flames several times, saw that Ula, the teacher and his partner in the rescue, was trapped beneath a front seat and her leg was burning. But by the time he got to her, it was too late. She was gone. He carried Ula from the bus and placed her on the ground. 
Her nephew, Sadie, watched in the rain while a man covered her with his coat. In all of this, Salem had felt nothing, not even as someone in the crowd grabbed at his arm and pinched him. One of Huda's nurses yelled to him that his jacket was on fire. He shouted back that it was not. The nurse put it out as he went to climb back into the bus. The few children still inside were no longer alive. The last boy Salem pulled out was facing down, crouched behind the frame of a seat. He was still wearing a backpack, which Salem held to pick the boy up. Stepping out of the bus for the final time, Salem broke out weeping, shouting that he should have saved more. Somehow, not a hair on his head was burned. Abu Faraj stood unmoving, in shock, as if mesmerized by the flames. Huda turned to the nurse beside her and saw that her face was black and streaked by rain. She realized she must look the same. They were soaked and bone-weary, and there was nothing more for them to do. When a Palestinian ambulance finally arrived, most of the injured children had already been evacuated. Huda didn't even notice it. The bus was still crackling with flames, and there was much shouting and commotion. Not a single firefighter, police officer, or soldier had come. Huda wanted to follow the children. She found her team, and they returned to the UNRWA van. Nida, the pregnant pharmacist, was still inside, inconsolable. Abu Faraj started dropping off everyone at home as Huda called around and confirmed that most of the children were in Ramallah. Then she phoned her UNRWA supervisor. He didn't understand the magnitude of the accident and demanded that the team turn around and go to Khan al-Ahmar or he would cut their pay. Huda refused and said he should cut just her salary, no one else's. After stopping for a quick shower, Huda set off for the hospital taking the clinic's social worker with her. When they got there, word sp spread that Huda had been at the crash. A great many parents and other relatives sought her out, asking whether she had seen a boy with a Spider-Man backpack, a girl with her hair and yellow ribbons. Huda told them all the same thing. The children had been covered in soot, and she couldn't tell what they were wearing. Going from room to room, Huda checked on the injured children, soothing them, since leaving the bus, she had felt something nagging at her. She was sure the kindergartners had been silent, at least early in their ordeal. Now, at the bed of one girl, Huda asked her why that was, why she had heard no sound. We were so scared, the girl said. When we saw the flames, we thought we had died. We thought we were in hell. It's really an amazing book, and your writing is so powerful. One of the most striking things is how the way you write, it's, it's as if one is there. It almost, it almost has a novelistic feel. And I'm wondering, how did you go about gathering information to, to be able to recount a scene where you obviously weren't there, and you did it with such sort of immediacy and such power? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you know, it was just the traditional methods of reporting. There were um, many, many, many uh, interviews with everyone I could possibly uh, reach who, who had been there. And um, and there were also uh, video and, and audio uh, recordings from the scene of the crash um, that I used in particular for, for the scenes like those. Um, uh, but yeah, there was there, that was really the the essence of it was lots and lots of time with um, the people who had been there. And how did people who were a part of this incident, how did they respond to your interest in recounting it and to interviewing them um, and, and to your presence in general in this world that's so different from, you know, where you live just, you know, in the same city? Yes. So um, I think that a, one of the things that was quite important that I, I'm not sure I, I realized at the time, but is clearer to me now, was that uh, I was not coming to them in the immediate aftermath of this accident. The accident took place in February 2012, and I was coming to these people uh, seven, eight years later. And, uh, and so it wasn't, it wasn't um, when there was a, a a large number of other journalists who were coming and, and, and talking to them. And it was after a period where um, for many of the, of the parents and, and others involved as well, um, 
they were traumatized, deeply traumatized by what had happened and um, yearned to talk about it and felt that there hadn't been anyone to talk to, particularly grieving parents. Uh, I found this repeatedly. Um, they were they were hungry to speak about it and to as an act of honoring their children and remembering their children and the people immediately around them, including their closest family members, were afraid to broach the subject in front of them and would actively avoid uh, bringing it up for fear of upsetting uh, the parent who who in fact you know really wanted to discuss it. So in some cases, I found that people were um, you know very, very open with me from, from the very beginning. Um, other people, there were people who didn't want to talk to me. Um, and, and, you know, as far as my coming from, from a different world, you know, very few people, um, question that they were just, they're so used to there being foreign journalists in this place. And, um, there wasn't a lot of questioning of, you know, who I was or where I was coming from, although, you know, they, they gathered that through, through our conversations. I would tell them, you know, that what the ambition of the book was, that this was, this was meant to not just be the story of the accident, but really to tell the whole story of Israel-Palestine. And, and all of them uh, understood that and, and, um, and, and wanted to, to participate in a project like that. Is the book available uh, in Arabic or in Hebrew? And is it is there is there been a response within Israel and within occupied territories um, to your work? So the um, there has there is an Arabic translation in the works, but it hasn't uh, been published yet. Um, and and the Hebrew translation, I hope we will find a Hebrew publisher who will be willing to take it on. But so far, um, most Hebrew publishers have have declined. Have said that they 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 don't want to. Um, there was a review in in a leading Israeli paper, Haaretz, a review slash interview with me right when the book came out, and the reviewer who, who it was very favorable and he liked the book a lot. He did say this will be a very difficult book for Israelis to read. Um, I again did a recent interview just this last weekend with Haaretz, which was um, very positive. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think you know the the audience for this kind of a thing in in Israel is probably small. I mean, there there's a there's not just a political reluctance. There's it's there's a commercial probably reluctance alongside the political one. One of the 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 book opens with a quotation talking about accidents um, and obviously the organizing moment uh, of the book is this horrific tragic bus accident of these kindergartners um, and yet it seems like one of the core themes or purposes of the book is to illustrate why this isn't just an accident that some aspects of what occurred were either preordained or or inevitable or or not as surprising as the term accident suggests that's right. I mean, the the one of the early uh, events that I did, the the moderator said to me, "It seems to me that this book is is um, about an accident that wasn't really isn't really an accident." And I thought that was a very succinct uh, way of putting it. Um, yeah, the the book is about is it's about an accident, but it is really about all of the uh, many, many layers of control of, of the, the, the uh, characters in this book that led to the specific outcome on that morning, that, that led to the route that this bus had to take as it had children who came from families with both green and blue IDs. So therefore they couldn't go to a play area just on the other side of the wall. So they had to take a long and winding path along the edge of the, uh, the wall about, you know, the, the, um, the checkpoint that they had to pass through and, and the, um, 
the the great neglect of of the people on the other side of the wall that led to the huge delays and the emergency services arriving at the site at the fact that the Palestinian Authority isn't allowed into more than 60% of the West Bank, which is where uh, this accident happened in in one of in that 60% that's not that they're not allowed in. So, you know, all of these policies that are in place, these policies to push as many Palestinians outside of the center of Jerusalem as possible, uh, while relinquishing the, the, the least amount of land possible, all of these policies led to um, the set of circumstances that, that produced the, the events as they unfolded that morning. Well, it's a very beautifully organized book, and and it, it doesn't just tell the story chronologically, which it, it basically does. It also has like a, a fascinating structure, and in, in one section is solely about the wall, and it makes the wall almost like an active character in the narrative you tell. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could go into a little bit about why you chose to privilege the wall in its own section, and a little bit what that section goes into um, in, in terms of the construction of the wall and its, its purpose and its structure. Sure. Um, so you're right, you know, the wall really is its own character in the book, and there's a, a section about it, um, and, and about really one individual, um, a, a colonel uh, in the Israeli army, who is the architect of the wall. And he happens to live in a settlement that is on the land of Anatta, uh, the land that these um, uh, parents and, and children come from, and uh, and you know that the wall shaped so much of the events that morning. It shaped how these people live uh, in this uh, confined uh, space. Uh, how they're uh, living in a situation where even emergency services won't come to them uh, without uh, a police or army escort. And, and so I, it was very important for me to tell the story of why the wall was routed in the way that it was, why these people were encircled, why they were put in, um, you know, why the, the ones who live in the annexed territory of, of Jerusalem why the wall was routed in such a way that they were pushed out from the center of Jerusalem. Um, and, and the answer to that was that there was an overriding policy to when the wall was, was being routed, was to try and push as many uh, Palestinians out of the heart of the city as possible um, because there is an ongoing demographic battle uh, uh, in the eyes of the Israeli state uh, in Jerusalem. And there is an explicit policy goal of maintaining a certain ratio of uh, Jews to Palestinians in Jerusalem and not allowing that ratio to drop below a certain level in order to keep a Jewish majority. Um, and and the, the um, colonel who created, uh, who's the architect of the wall and selected its route uh, in Jerusalem, he was also an expert uh, map maker and a territorial expert for um, for Israel in all its negotiations with the Palestinians. And so he had not only uh, created the wall in the early 2000s, but he was also responsible for creating the maps that delineated where the Palestinian Authority would be allowed to operate within the West Bank. Um, so within you know the West Bank, there are as I said, 60% of it, which contains all of the settlements, um, a little more than 60%, roughly 62% contains all of the settlements and all the settler roads. And that is one big contiguous area. Um, and then within that contiguous area are a bunch of little islands where Palestinians have varying degrees of autonomy, 165 of these little islands. So this colonel, Danny Tirza, he, um, created the maps of where these islands would be. And there too, it was a similar logic where there's a very dense uh, Palestinian population area. There, the idea was let them have some uh, self-governance there. And where there's open land, where we, we, Israel would like to expand and have settlements grow, 
that's the area we want to control and and establish new settlements and military um, firing areas that then later become settlements and bases and so forth. Um, so uh, again, the, this this central idea of where Palestinians live in, in dense concentrations, we push them aside, we wall them off, and where there's land that could be uh, built on for Jewish settlement, um, then th that's an area we need to maintain our control. In some ways, that makes it seem that this wall that encircles this community or these, these several communities, that it's actually an element of if there were ever to be a two-state solution, that this is a core element of a peace plan. Does that seem to make sense? So um, the, the wall doesn't actually follow the um, pre-1967 border. So, um, you know, if we if we uh, zoom out for a second uh, under Israel's control uh, between the uh, Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, um, the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza are 22 percent of the land. Seventy eight percent of the land is Israel within its pre-1967 borders. And if we take the areas of Palestinian autonomy, they're about 10% of the overall uh, land under Israel's control. And, and the wall does not follow what's known as the green line, the, the line uh, demarcating the, the West Bank and East Jerusalem from uh, Israel and its pre-1967 borders. So the wall, you know, if you really zoom out, it, it looks like it's roughly along it, but it's actually cutting in and taking land from the West Bank. It's taking, you know, it it has been routed in different ways over time and it's shifted, but it's around 10% uh, of the West Bank that it takes. So um, there is no, there is no peace negotiation that's ever taken place where it was presumed that the wall would actually be uh, the border. The, the wall would have to uh, come down and be shifted in order for there to be uh, a traditional uh, two-state solution with land swaps and Palestinians get 22% of, of historic Palestine. Um, so I'd like to open up to all the those who are in, intend uh, in attendance. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, please just type that question into the question box in Zoom and I'll play the role of moderator. Feel free to um, to ask anything here. Here's Actually, here's a question. Martin Fahey asks, given your experience, what do you think is the likelihood of self-determination governance for Palestinians that can lessen the chances of further conflict with Israel? In your view, is a two-state solution the only solution to the ongoing conflict? And is that possible? So I, uh, I think that the likelihood of of seeing Palestinian statehood or, or self-determination in in uh, the next you know decades is very low um I I think that the the most likely outcome is that we will not see two states we will not see one state uh, but rather we will see a continuation of this current system with Israel controlling uh uh, 7 million Jews and 7 million Palestinians, and the vast majority of those Palestinians don't have basic civil rights. And there were different kinds of arrangements that Israel will try and make for the Palestinians under its control, but without giving them either a state or citizenship. Um, th that's what I see as, as, as the most likely uh, future. Um, a related question, will there be from Zev Goldberg, will there be peace in Palestine if Zionism demands a Jewish state? So um, if you ask, it, it depends, you know, it depends who you're asking. <laughs> if you're asking the mainstream uh, PLO, uh, the the current uh, leaders of the Palestinian National Movement, which excludes Hamas and Islamic Jihad, um, they would say that um, that they accept that there would be two states. A Palestinian state would be on twenty two percent of the land, and the other state uh, will be uh, Israel. And so Israel is entitled to 
you know, be whatever kind of state it wants to be. They're not in love with the idea of Israel being a Jewish state and, and discriminating against Palestinian citizens within that state. Um, but but they have repeatedly said that they're okay with this formula of, of so-called two states for two peoples. Um, so if you ask them, then, you know, Zionism is not an obstacle to having a, a, a resolution. If you ask other people, particularly younger Palestinians, uh, th they would say, uh, y yes, it, it is an obstacle that, you know, uh, partition of uh, Palestine uh, is unacceptable and it, and it won't work. And there needs to be uh, a full equality. And there has to be more than that. There has to be a fair distribution of land and people who uh, whose lands were taken, including Palestinian citizens of Israel whose lands were taken, need to be able to to reclaim those lands. So it's a, it's more than just you know getting citizenship; it's it's decolonization. Um, so it, it in part the answer will will depend on who prevails within the Palestinian national movement. Right now, um, the leaders of it are uh, have are actually accommodating themselves to, to Zionism. Interesting. Now, now we've turned sort of to the, the current situation and to the difficult terrain of solutions. And can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, if a two state solution isn't possible and if a one state solution, all these things that are talked about and the kind of qu quite a lot over here in the United States as well, sort of distant from the situation, are there smaller actions that the Israeli state could engage with that would ameliorate or improve or in any way uh, uh, tend, take the, the, the situation to a somewhat better place? Uh, there are definitely, you know, obviously it's a system of oppression. So there are many, many things that you can do to ease it, to make it less bad. There are things you can do to make it more bad. Those aren't things that actually resolve uh, uh, anything, uh, but but they are uh, measures that Israel is constantly talking about and sometimes implementing in order to better maintain this, this system. So, um, you know, for the first 20 years, uh, for, the, for more than that, for the first uh, 27 years of uh, Israel's occupation, there was no Palestinian authority, and Israel um, was, you know, administering all of the West Bank and Gaza and the city centers and all the people there. And it was only because twenty years into that occupation, there was an uprising known as the First Intifada. That from that Intifada, Israel concluded that the costs were too high of administering this themselves, and they wanted Palestinians to have some. So basically to outsource uh, at least major parts of administration in city centers in Gaza and the West Bank to the Palestinians to lighten the burden of occupation for Israel. And, and that is how the PA was created. So that's a, an example of measures that are taken that change the system, um, uh, change how people live, for people like Abed, the creation of the PA and and the establishment of of the of the Oslo Accords led to many new restrictions. It led to uh, a increase in in um, restrictions on their movement and checkpoints and the permit system. Um, so for many people, that this this actually made made life worse. And and in in recent years, there has been talk of um, you know. Neftali Bennett and and uh, you know Netanyahu himself for many years he talked about economic peace. So that was about taking measures that would ameliorate uh, certain aspects of of, of Palestinian economic um, uh, deprivation in order to have the system continue for a longer time for Israel uh, for to lighten the burden of occupation. So, so yes, I think that there are things like that that can be done uh, that are always under consideration, uh, but they're very far from actually uh, resolving anything or, or creating a situation of, of peace. 
a question here from Abdullah Ramzan. Um, how much of an obstacle do, you, do are the settlements in the West Bank? How much obstacles is posed to a two-state solution? What can be done to address the challenge that settlements pose? And I'd like to add, add to that, if you don't mind, um, this question, which is, how does all of this play into the U.S.'s ability to influence things, specifically because it was, you know, quite openly U.S. policy to say no new settlements should be built, say during the Obama administration, that apparent that didn't seem to have great effect. So, building on that question about settlements and U.S. influence, you know, where does all of this uh, take us? So, um, settlements are are. Uh an enormous obstacle to a um uh a two state uh, outcome they they are there are more than 700,000 um settlers in in the uh occupied territory right now and most people think that it is um a total fantasy that you would remove the number that you would need to remove to arrive at a, at a at a two state outcome there are other two state diehards who will say no they're concentrated in such a way that you can carve around them and do land swaps and make it work but you know it, it's certainly the case no one denies that with every passing year it's harder and harder to imagine how that would happen many people believe it's it's long past point of past a point where it, it's at all realistic to to believe that that the number of settlers that would need to be removed would be removed. So it, as far as a two-state outcome goes, it's a huge, uh, a huge obstacle. Um, regarding U.S. policy, you know, the U.S. policy is to essentially give Israel uh, total backing uh, in the U.N. Security Council against any kind of uh, measures against settlements, any resolutions against settlements, even declarative resolutions against settlements, and, and uh, to uh, fund Israel to the tune of nearly $4 billion, uh, per year, and protect Israel in all kinds of ways in Europe to work behind the scenes to make sure that there are no actions taken against Israel, including against settlements. And, and so today, um, you don't even have a ban of settlement goods in the US or in Europe. And so for all of the talk of, you know, everybody's opposed to settlements and the EU is opposed to settlements and the US is opposed to settlements, there's been almost no action taken against them. And, and so when the US says, you know, we're opposed to settlements, but we're, we're, there are zero consequences and we're giving you, you know, we're not only giving you the 3.3 that we used to give you billion per year, but we're increasing that amount uh, as Obama did. Um, you know, the, then then it's it's pretty it's pretty meaningless. It's a policy of Israel, of the U.S. wagging its finger and and nothing more. Do you think that a change in U.S. policy would have a significant impact on uh, politics on the ground in Israel as regards any of these issues, whether it's settlements or advancing some sort of tentative peace process or whatever that might be? Yes, it, it's it, absolutely. The U.S. has enormous leverage over Israel. Every Israeli national security expert and former chief of staff and general and, uh, you know, all the kind of security establishment says the number one um, security interest of Israel is to maintain a close relationship with the United States. And if the U.S. were ever uh, to actually take measures with teeth, they could uh, change settlement policy very quickly. Interesting. Here's a question from Jocelyn Garcia. What can Christians and people in general do to fight the religious ideologies that are driving Zionist support here in the United States? I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Um, Pastor John Hagee is very vocal about Christians supporting Israel 100%, although I don't agree with his sentiments, as are, of course, lots of folks within the U.S. Um, Christian community and other communities. Um, so sorry, the question is about what can, can what Christian Zionists- What can Christians Zionists... in the U.S. do yeah. Yeah, to, to sort of challenge this dominance among uh, you know Christian communities in the U.S. for like full-fledged support 
for Israel um, and and some of the policies you've talked about. Uh, well, I, th I think that it's enormously uh, important for there to be activism uh, within uh, churches. I think that's a, that's a very powerful uh, means of bringing about change in the U.S. Um, and that there are, my understanding is that the even the evangelical community is not um, as uh, as you know uniform as many people might assume, and especially among our younger evangelicals, there's much more um, criticism of Israel, and, and and you know there are there are there there is a long history of activism by church groups. There's now a coalition, an ex, an anti-apartheid coalition of more than ten different denominations. Um, in the U.S., that that are trying to organize together to to um, change U.S. policy and to make their voices heard, I think I think uh, to bring about changes in in the Christian community is is uh, in, enormously important. I'm wondering. So so obviously, you know, your book came out interestingly just a few days before the October seventh Hamas attack. Uh, that's just you know the focus of so much attention, and of course you know, leading to this devastating set of military operations in Gaza. Um, you live in Israel. You have spent years and years engaging with these issues, political issues in the country, relationship between Israel and Palestinians. Uh, what, how has the mood changed with October 7th? Uh, how have things shifted in your own, you know, conversations with those in the Palestinian community? And with just the full array of these issues, what's the what's the feeling like there that you could help us understand? Um, since we're so far away from the directness of that, yeah. So, I mean, everyone is still, uh, to use a, a very over use overused word, is is still traumatized by. Uh, the war in Gaza and uh, October 7th. And so um, no one feels that that's behind them. The war is still going on and, and um, the hostages are still in, in, in Gaza and we don't even have a full count of uh, how many um, Palestinians have died in Gaza, over 31,000, but countless others under the rubble unaccounted for. Um, so the, there is a very kind of depressed uh, mood that exists, particularly among Palestinians who are feeling utter uh, despair at the fact that this war is still happening, that um, you have these uh, uh, this mass killing going on uh, for months and months and months, and the whole world is... Uh, doing virtually nothing to stop it. Um, so, you know, where I live in East Jerusalem, I mean, in Jerusalem, the the two sides of the city are very um, uh, divided. And Palestinian East Jerusalem is really, it's, it's deeply uh, depressed uh, and, and people are in mourning. In, in uh, West Jerusalem, in many respects, life has seems to have resumed to normal. Almost all of the reservists who had been fighting in Gaza that had kind of slowed the Israeli economy have been uh, pulled back. And the cafes are full and there's uh, uh, traffic as there always was uh, in the city. There was this period immediately after October 7th, which was really a COVID-like atmosphere where um, the streets felt empty. And, and that's not the case anymore. And you see also with the exit of Israelis to, to resume tourism abroad, um, in many respects for Israelis, life is uh, resuming. And, and I, for Palestinians, this is just a totally different situation. The, the West Bank, there are the greatest restrictions on movement that they have ever faced since the beginning of the occupation. Um, trips that used to take me 30 minutes now take me three hours in, in the West Bank. And uh, the main source of uh, employment for Palestinians in the West Bank are jobs in Israel and the settlements. And almost all of those, save for a few thousand, have uh, dried up. And this affects every extended family in the West Bank. So they're um, feeling uh, locked in. 
uh, unable to move. There's a huge spike in killing, more than 400 Palestinians killed uh, by, by Israel since uh, in the West Bank since October 7th, a spike in settler violence, a spike in forced displacement, more than a thousand Palestinians forced from their homes uh, in, uh, in the West Bank just in the month after October 7th. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that's to say nothing of, of, of Gaza. And many of these people have relatives and friends who are, who are in Gaza, who are, um, now facing starvation. Is there anything about what's October 7th and its aftermath that has heightened awareness within Israel about the basic story of your book, which is just the, the incredible pain and difficulty of daily life for Palestinians. Has that has there been a growth in empathy or a, a kind of greater awareness of that aspect of, of what it means to 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 live in, in these these territories? Yeah. I, I think the opposite actually. I think that um since October 7th, there has been a great decrease in empathy for Palestinians. Not that it was so high to begin with, but a, a, a marked uh, decrease in empathy, uh, huge uh, uh, support for uh, the war, belief that uh, Israel is using the right amount of uh, force, very little opposition to using uh, uh, you know, starvation as a method of, of, of war, of restricting humanitarian aid into Gaza and watching as uh, North Gaza is, is, is in famine. Um, uh, so so at, what you see is a mainstreaming of utter dehumanization of Palestinians, major Palest politicians on TV uh, saying uh, horrific and racist things. Um, and, 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 you know, we saw at the case of the ICJ, um, the genocide case at the ICJ, where they laid out how, how much incitement there had been by leading Israeli figures, um, you know, that, that, that is the atmosphere. It's, re it's really kind of the, the opposite of, um, of feeling any kind of empathy for Palestinians. We're coming to the very end of our event. I thank you so much for joining us. I, I just, you know, it's such a grim situation. There's such great tragedy. You know, you you focused on what you call microhistory, a, a momentary illustration, but of course now we're talking about you know the the brutal violence in Gaza and this grim situation. Um, but in reading your book, one thing I it seemed that came out came to me was that it's very much a book about love, in that the stories of the people you recount because you recounted with a great deal of sensitivity and intimacy with the, the folks you've reported on. Um, I'm wondering if if that's some a, some aspect of the story you're trying to tell because it, there, there's failed love, there's there's marriages, there's the love of a father for a child even amidst tragedy. Just wondering to what degree that is a motivating feature in your writing and your book and, and what you do. Well, thank you for that question. I'm very glad to hear that's something that you took away from the book, um, because it was absolutely central to me in, in the writing of it. Uh, this book was really a departure for me from other kinds of writing I'd done, which is much more analytical and much more um, historical. Um, and um, and the, the love that these people have for one another, for, for their um, uh, children. That was the, the, the heart of this, this whole book for me. And, um, and, you know, one of, one of the things that, um, that made it, you know, very difficult at times to write. Well, thank you so much, Nathan, for joining us. Thank you, everybody who's who spent you know an hour with us this afternoon? Um, it's an extraordinary book, and we're really privileged to be able to um, include you in our speaker series. So thank you. Thank you for having me. It was really a pleasure.